Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Pasadena, California at the Los Angeles Concord Elegance. This is a collection of the most beautiful cars you have ever seen. We're going to do what we do every week. You're going to get a chance to see some of these cars, meet some of the owners, and hear some great music. So do what I tell you to do every week. Just kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. <laughs> One of the great things about the automotive hobby is there are certain cars that just, they go through the whole spectrum of people that appreciate cars. Everybody, no matter if you're into Ferraris or rat rods, whatever, you're going to like certain cars. A 1942 town and country Chrysler is definitely falls into that category. Aaron Weiss, this is an amazing car. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, just gone through about two years of restoration, and uh, we found it back east from a gentleman who restores Woody's. Uh, very much an eastern car. The town and countries were bought by a lot of hotels and resorts to pick up people at the train station and bring them back to the hotel. And this one is a nine passenger with the luggage rack on the roof and is all ready to pick up the next load of tourists and bring them to the resort. Uh, there was a 998 made and uh, the Chrysler Town and Country Registry feels that there's somewhere around 18 left. And then those numbers mirror for the 1941 model and the 1942 model. When people think of Woody's, they think of Beach Boys and station wagons and surfboards. This, this is a little different rig here. This is uh, more of the uh, Cunningham uh, Happy Days family kind of car, uh, the, the epitome of warm and fuzzy. Do you get 
kind of reactions from people that, oh, I didn't know they made uh, ones like this. I thought they were all station wagons. What's When you pull into the Safeway parking lot, if you do in this car, wherever you pull in, what kind of reaction do you get from people? A crowd. We get a crowd wherever we go with it because it's so unique. People really didn't realize that there were these kind of station wagons manufactured pre-war. And this was the last, this 1942 is literally the last car made by Chrysler after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. All uh, domestic passenger car manufacturing was uh, stopped in February of 1942. So this was it. Uh, and it is a family car. It's, I think the, the, some of the Ford Woodies and stuff, yeah, it looks, you need a surfboard on the rack and you, you know, and all those stickers of wherever you've been. But this is more of a, what I would call a Hamptons car. This would have been something that somebody on the East Coast of the United States or maybe up in Gross Point, Michigan would have owned. And it was a more elegant car. And that's why they called it town and country. The country it was like a, an estate car for your ranch or your farm, and, and yet you could drive it in town, so town and country, and that's how they came up with the name. Uh -huh. This type of car, I would think it was a big deal back then, what you just described, and then it probably maybe fell out of favor for a little while, wasn't that sought after, and then and all of a sudden people were like, wow, we got to get one of those, they're really rare. Is, is that how you see it, or is there a different... Uh, well, there was a war in between all this. So 1942 they stopped, in 1946 they started production again. In fact, I have a 46 Chrysler Town & Country convertible. And part of that was the wood was great because there wasn't a lot of metal available. And uh, people remembered that trend and came back. But I think it's like fashion or anything else. After a while, it becomes passe. And within a couple of years, by 1948, 9, the woody was really just wood trim on the doors. And the, the full wood had gone away. And then it kind of went away for a while. And then I think somewhere in the 50s, you started seeing plastic wood on the cars. And it kind of came back. So I think it's like a fashion statement, like bell bottoms or paisley or something. It comes and goes. Mm -hmm. How does this go down the road? Is plenty of power, everything you need? Well, it's a real interesting car. It's like the transmission is one step behind the full automatic transmission as fluid drive. So it's a very interesting transmission from that standpoint. Once you get going, it's smooth and it's a heavy car and it tracks the road really well and it's, it's, it's fun to drive. So you accelerate, you go off the pedal back on, and it shifts, right? Uh, yeah, you go through, you start out in first gear, you go to second, and then you'll hit, you'll, you'll accelerate, and it automatically goes into what it would be called like an overdrive. Mm -hmm. And then when you slow down, you hit the brake, and it'll come back down in the second. But when you do come to a stop, you've got to go manually back in the first and start the process over again. Uh -huh. But uh, that's how these, uh, it's just a really wonderful car. And it has power steering, and it, it's, it's a great car. Mm -hmm. We're here at the L.A. Concours, and this is real upmarket. This is some, some real high-buck cars here, and your car is appreciated here. But as I alluded to in the opening, you could pull into Bob's Big Boy, and everybody would go nuts. Or you could go to the Rat Rod show, and everybody would go nuts. You could, th this, this opens every door, I would think. Oh, it does. We had it up at the Art uh, College of Art Design here in Pasadena last year, and that's where the most avant-garde cars of their time are shown each year. And this was here, and it was really quite a success. It draws a crowd wherever you go, because I think it's very nostalgic. And people look to go back in their youth. They're searching for their lost youth or a, or a glimpse of what uh, they may have experienced as a a teenager or a child and they remember and these cars are something that have pleasurable memories and they want to relive those moments. Uh -huh. Well my youth was uh, lost long ago so I'm going to walk around the concourse okay, here and well, see if I can find it again so thank you Aaron. Well thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
you look kind of familiar. You look, have we done an interview with you recently? Well, I think so. I was looking for a job, and, you know, I applied, and, you, and here I am. So, so the audition continues here. Yes, it does. Right. It does. Well, Aaron, now you're going to share with us about your 1931 Cadillac. Yes, uh, this is 1930-31, uh, same body style. Uh, Sport Phaeton, they made 85 of these over the two-year period, and uh, this is one of 18 that they believe are still left. I was explaining to you uh, off camera how when I go to these shows, I just walk around and certain cars speak to me. It's just like, I'm the one. I'm the car you have to have on the show. Go find my owner. This one yelled at me. It screamed at me when I walked by. What do you think it is that, that causes that to happen? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's enough chrome on here to uh, blind a, a troop of, an army troop. And second of all, the colors are very compelling. The blue and silver really come out at you and the red interior and someone was mentioning to me at lunch today they could see the car across the field because of the red piping and the uh, roof so it's got a lot of bling. 31 Cadillacs of course in 1931 were a big deal but how do they stack up against Auburn's and and some of the other high-end cars at that time as far as the, the appeal that they had then and the appeal that they have now? Uh, Lawrence Fisher who is uh, president of Cadillac at that time had long engineered the V16 as a way to get ahead of Packard and anybody else that happened to be in their competitive way. And these cars were very compelling because uh, nobody else had a 16. Uh, you had Lincoln and uh, uh, a couple other companies with 12s, but nobody had a 16. And in the end, there was only one other company that came out with a 16, which was Marmon, and they didn't last past 1933. It took them so long to develop the car, the Cadillac had the market share, and that was the end of it. How much uh, manpower does it take to keep those 16 cylinders under control? Uh, did it, uh, uh, you know, is this a wrestling match to drive or is it pleasant to drive? Well, it's a pleasant car to drive when it's tuned in. And if it's actually like two eight cylinder engines uh, welded together, and you can drive the car on one. Uh, bank of eight cylinders and not the other. It won't go very fast, but you'll move. Mm -hmm. So it's got to, everything's got to be there to have the power and the acceleration. And the key is to balance the carburetors. And once that's tuned in, there's nothing like it. It's quiet, it's smooth, and it's got torque that just doesn't end. And that was why they came out with the 16-cylinder, was that the more cylinders you have, the less vibration you have, and the more torque. And these cars weigh over 6,000 pounds. So you need a lot of torque to get off the off the uh, line with them. What's the horsepower in cubic inch? Well, the ho the uh, horsepower is about uh, somewhere around 150, 160 horsepower, but, but the uh, uh, displacement is about 450 cubic inches. Mm -hmm. It's a big engine, but it's torque. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not designed for top end speed. Maybe you could probably take these out at about 100 miles an hour top end. The other thing that's interesting, you can start off the line in second gear. It's torque so low. So you can go in the first, you should go in the first gear, but you don't have to. Well, we're not going to see you drag race in this at Irwindale or anything. No, I don't think we, we do very well. Coming to something like the L.A. Concorde, does that give you an opportunity to, to put some, some road time underneath these, or are they all trailered in? How often do you get to really use this as a car? Well, I wish we could use it every day because it's really a pleasure to drive, but today we got to put six miles on it, and my buddy who brought it over with me made a wrong turn. We did a lap around the Rolls Bowl, so we did another three miles to so nine miles, and at the end of the day, 15. That's a record uh, one-day uh, distance for this car in its recent history so i wish we could drive it more but uh we can't but the shows are fun to go to and they're fun to drive and sometimes there's a tour or something and we'll take it on a tour so that was an accident your buddy accidentally took a wrong turn and had to put another three miles on it well, he won't owe up to it but uh, I, I i know what he's guilty of well aaron this is a beautiful car uh part of a beautiful collection that you own and just thank you very much for allowing us on the vintage vehicle show to take a close look at it well thank you
Vaughn Vartanian, you have a 1909 Pierce Arrow. I don't know that I've ever had a 1909 Pierce Arrow on the show, and, and if I did, it wasn't a bright red one. Tell us about this one. Well, this one happens to be a particularly unusual piece. Uh, there's only two of these left that we know of. The other one belonged to Otis Chandler for a time, and before that to Mr. Browning for a time. And um, there's uh, a lot of history in this car. It was owned by a uh, uh, Senator Bovey from Montana as the second owner. It came out of uh, Oregon originally. Obviously a very wealthy man. Uh, 199 money, $5,000. It's a lot of money. Um, then it uh, went to uh, the son of the heiress of Mr. Post cereal um, in Escondido, a man named Willis Boyd, and then came to us. Pretty fortunate. You were mentioning off camera that the, the composition of this, you have copper hood, aluminum this, so it, it, it seems it's to be a, an odd, were they still trying to figure out you know, whether to press them all out of steel or this was the best stuff available at the time? Well, Pierce was very fussy about strength, quality, durability, uh, the ability for the paint to stay on the car. When you had a, a wood frame body covered in sheet aluminum or covered in sheet steel, the paint would flake off or it would flex. This is quarter inch, or eighth inch thick cast aluminum in the body. The, the fenders are made out of sheet aluminum. They wanted it light as they could for as big as it was, for as strong as it could be, for it to last. Uh, every car was pre-tested every which way, before the body, after the body, and if it didn't work, they took the part and threw it in a pile. So what is the weight on this and the powertrain? What kind of horsepower and, and uh, all of that? Well, this is considered a Pierce uh, 48 horse. Um, it's it's uh, got a top speed with, a, say, a modern carburetor, probably do 70 miles an hour plus. But with this carburetor stock, it'll top out at 55 miles an hour at about 1,400 RPM with seven full adults in it. Uh, on the freeway, it'll do just fine. Uh, it weighs uh, 3,864 pounds, something like that. And it's a 130-inch 130, 30, wheelbase, which is a pretty good-sized car for its day. It, this, the length of this car would be equal to what modern-day car? Or, say, 50s or 60s era car? Pretty much a lot of cars, 130 inches. It's, it's not real, real big compared to a modern car, but for its day, it was very large. It was very large. It's on the cusp of the Great Arrow. Great Arrow finishing in 1908. George N. Pierce retiring. Pierce Arrow being taken over, being called the Pierce Arrow Motor Car Company. And this has accoutrement from, from the Great Arrow as the hubcaps and the sill plates and the headlight bonnets and things like that. Um, uh, they locked the hood from the factory. It has two Yale locks on the hood. They didn't want the owner, they didn't want you to get in there and make a mess out of it, basically. So, so back in 1909, if you were the proud owner of a brand new one of these, say, in the, the wild, wild west, like in Seattle, is, was there somebody there that, that had the key to that lock and could work on the car, or did they, they uh, send somebody out on the train to take care of it? Well, the people who drove the car actually had a two-week process at the factory to train them how to operate and maintain the car. So the keys came with the car. Uh, the same key was, a, uh, was for the hood, under the front seat, under the back seat, in the glove boxes, and under the rear. It was one key, did everything. But truly, you'd have someone accomplished, maybe a mechanic or a, or a, a, a chauffeur to drive you around in a car like this in that day. You mentioned going down the road at 55 miles an hour with your the, with the car loaded. Mm -hmm. What kind of are, are cars going off in ditches every direction? Looking, at, you have to be pretty careful, I would imagine, that people don't run into you, the gawkers. Well, I think the most frightening thing that day uh, that uh, we were talking about was the truckers. They uh, they definitely caused a wind problem for me. But uh, being as heavy as she is, and that many. And I'm not exactly tiny, so being as heavy as we all were, it kind of kept us on the road. She did real well. It'll, it'll go down the road all day long like that. Well, it's a beautiful car, and I have to be careful that I don't get into too much of a wind problem here uh, asking too many questions. So, Vaughn, thank you very much My for being pleasure. on the Vintage Vehicle Show. Beautiful thank car. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Ed Birchman, 1937 Lincoln. This is a car you don't see every day, and especially one in this configuration. Tell us about this car. Uh, this car is a one of a kind that was built by the uh, Durham Coach Company in Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. And uh, they built this car in 1937 as one model to see how it would sell. Unfortunately, at that time, the economy was so bad and the price was so high on this car that it did not sell. And uh, they decided, since it was such a difficult seller, just to stop at making one. That was my good luck. The Ford Company, what did they, what, what did Durham start with? Uh, Durham uh, received the uh, chassis, which is the st structure that you don't see on the car that supports the engine, and they just received uh, up to the uh, end of the engine and the front fenders. From everything back from this part of the car called the cowl, they uh, had the uh, Durham Company build it as a custom design so that all the, all the doors are uh, custom made, all the fenders, uh, the two rear fenders are custom made, yeah, the upholstery, everything is unique to this car. Uh, as, it, as I say, except for the engine compartment and front fenders. Did you know the history of this car before you became the owner? Was it something you, you, you know, from the age of 12 you wanted this car, or did you, how, how did this come into your possession? I, I knew of this car by virtue of uh, it being a lost car. The, uh, it was known throughout the car business that this car once existed, but had been lost somewhere in the early 50s. And uh, when someone told me they saw this in a, uh, a, f a farmhouse or farm uh, combination barn garage, uh, they saw this, went in and met the, the then owner who said he would be willing to sell it because his wife wants him to get rid of this piece of junk. So he, uh, my friend advised me uh, of its availability. I called the, the, the then owner asked if it was for sale and we agreed on a price and I flew out that weekend with my son to drive it back home as the car was brought out of the uh, the barn and raised up onto a truck he saw the uh, profile that he was not able to see when it was buried in the uh, barn and he thought to renege on the purchase uh, trying to get out of the sale and I kept pressing him about the legality of an oral agreement. Uh, uh, he had signed all the papers and he had received the monies, but yet he was reluctant to release it. Then I came with a different tact. And I said, well, how about your wife? I said, well, then he said, okay, it's sold. Uh, he, couldn't, uh, he forgot about his wife, so nagging. And uh, from that moment on, it's been in my possession. It, uh, that was in 1977. So I've had it for 30 years. The restoration started around the year 2000, although selected elements were rebuilt uh, during my earlier ownership. And uh, everything was restored on the car. There was not one fastener, not one bolt, not one screw that escaped my attention, plus all the major parts too. The power plant on this, what's the running gear? What keeps this car going down the road? Well, it's a, uh, a traditional 12-cylinder Lincoln engine uh, known as the K-series. Uh, they have several, several before that. And the uh, K-series is a 12-cylinder engine, which traces its uh, heritage clear back to the Liberty engine that was in the Jenny of World War I. A piece of advice we'd like from you. The viewers watching the show, lots of them want to get into the hobby, and their budget may only allow for, uh, you know, to begin with that, that four-door duster or something, but they, they long to get into where they can have something that can be here in the show in L.A. What, uh, other than, than getting a really good job, what's the, the one piece of advice that you would give them to, to set them off on that, that uh, path? Well, I would suggest... Uh, being very circumspect in selecting the car that you want because I would suspect that uh, the cost of repairing a high quality car and a 
what might be called a more competitively priced car is the same. But at the end, you will own a much more worthy car with the same amount of investment. So be very careful on selecting what you want. Don't take some uh, any, uh, some anybody type of car, but be a uh, uh, be uh, discriminating uh, and try to find out if after you've completed the restoration, it will be of a high value rather than a. Uh, uh, an ordinary car. Well, you obviously were discriminating in your choice on this particular car. You ended up with something that uh, it's, it's worth more than a four-door duster by about a thousand times, I would guess. That's correct. And that's the, that's the issue. Uh, just think that when you chrome plate a bumper on, a, say, a Rolls-Royce and a bumper on a Model A Ford, it's just about the same price. But at the end, you will have a very significant uh, appreciation in your investment when you go for a, a high-quality car, not necessarily a Rolls-Royce. And Do you know the one thing that lets you know you made the right choice? When you're standing next to this car, if you hear bagpipes in the background, <laughs> that means you made the perfect choice. Yes, it's like music from some economic heaven. All right, well, thanks for being on the Vintage Vehicle Show, and you have a beautiful right. car. Thank you, thank you. Tony Hiller, I'm walking around the show today and thinking I need to be treated with with style and dignity and how would I do that? Well, I think it would be to go for a ride in your 58 Cadillac limousine. This is an incredible car. Most definitely. Most definitely. How did this come into your ownership and what was it like when it arrived? Well, I, I own so many Cadillacs. They come to me. I don't look for them no more, you know. But I came across this car with a guy named uh, Craig Carr. He makes rubber products for any kind of vehicle. 
and uh, he had the old limo sitting outside his warehouse, and he wasn't going to do anything with it. So somebody told a friend, another friend told me. I came and looked at the car, and I bought it. Mm -hmm. You know, and at that time it was a rusting hulk or a lot there. Or? It was rusting in peace, you know, and uh, needed total restoration, but it did run. So the brakes were shot. I had to go through the whole car. I gutted it. Did the upholstery, Jenkins interior, uh, all the Chrome Christian Brothers. Uh, you know, I have people in place to kind of do everything since I've been doing it so long. Mm -hmm. This is maybe my 15th car that I've done, personal car. Yeah. Is it the first limousine or have you done lots of them? And, and the reason for that question is I know some parts are available for these things, but when you get into the limousine territory, does it, it, it create a whole bunch of new problems? Uh, yeah, it is a slight more problem because they didn't make that many of them. I think this model, they only made 530 of them. And uh, most of them was like for private uh, people that own, ordered them back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. But... This kind of car, you you can go to Bob's Big Boy, you can go to the L.A. Concours, you can go to, you're, you're crossing the lots of, of uh, hobby lines here. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a road car. I didn't drove, not this car, particular car, but I didn't drove cars in the 40s to Memphis, Tennessee, Chicago, back around to Vegas, and back to L.A. Mm -hmm. You know, no problem. If you go through the engine, these are road cars. Matter of fact, they ride better at 75, 80 miles an hour. You know. I see uh, pictures of Elvis in the back, and you told me uh, before the interview that no, this wasn't one of Elvis's cars, but it does look like it needs to have you know Jerry Lee Lewis in the back, or <laughs> or you know somebody sticking out the back of it. Yeah. Well, everybody asked me that. That's the number one question of the day. Did Elvis own this car? He did own over 200 Cadillacs, and anybody he liked or admired or just you know knew, he gave him Cadillacs for gifts, and they had to take it, you know, because he would get mad if they wouldn't accept his gift, you know. But this is mostly props that I have, you know. And uh, the background on it, do you know the, the history back to 50, uh, 58? Well, the, the, the second owner is here today. He's the head oh. judge. His name is uh, uh, Craig Carr. And uh, he bought the car in the early, late 60s from a guy that was a lawyer that defended somebody in the mafia. Uh. <laughs> yeah, he know the, now he should be the one you should interview about because he know the whole history of this car. But he told it to me several times, you know, that a guy he defended, his, his best friend was a lawyer, mm -hmm. and he defended this guy, and he gave him a Rolex watch, and he gave him the car. He didn't want any money. So, you so know, the mafioso have ridden around in the back of it. Definitely, definitely. The limousine portion of the hobby you kind of have you, you're welcomed at any car show but you have your own things going too where there's limousines and hearses and police cars and emergency vehicles uh, is this a big player in that community oh yeah definitely uh, matter of fact I've been in a Cadillac so long uh, I have my own Cadillac club we meet at this place called Rick and Ronnie's in the South Bay area every first Wednesday of every month and uh, but like I say the hearse I use it for proms weddings you know I'm having fun with it I just don't set it up in the building like I used to do What's the secret in doing something like that? I have seen guys will go out and get a couple of old limousines, uh, refurbish them, start a limo business, and, and uh, six months later they're gardeners someplace. It, it doesn't seem to work. What's the secret to making well, it work? You know, you got to be out there on, on the level working all the time. A lot of times when I do a job, even if it's just a simple prom, I may give out 25 or 30 calls cards you know and eventually to come back and you're always and when you're in the cars that's when you get a lot of network and it's really a word of mouth you know you advertising advertising is great i do that too but the majority of my jobs 90 percent of my jobs come from just referrals and people that see the car i don't care if it's at a gas station or riding down the street you know you know i get a lot of jobs like that so i've been pretty busy so if I got out of the TV business, I could be one of your drivers, you think? <laughs> one of my drivers, yeah. you got to take a course, though. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm good at courses. Uh, Tony, thank you very much for being on the Vintage Vehicle Show. This is a beautiful car. Most definitely. Thank you. We have had such a fantastic time here at the Los Angeles Concord Elegance. Great people, great location here in the Rose Bowl. But every good show comes to an end. So what I want you to do is watch the show next time. And, Tony, what I want you to do is drive me back to Seattle. Can you do that? Most definitely. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.